It had already been scheduled for months at the senior center in Central Park, but with a recent major earthquake in Mexico, the focus on disaster preparedness came full circle inside the Parkview Room as the host city of Huntington Beach and the Orange County Association of Realtors welcomed and joined the many agencies and support groups of our communities and further connected with those who signed up to attend, from former mayors to the decision makers of today, interested guests and members of the public. Tuesday, September 19th for the event, Dr. Lucy Jones, the Earthquake Lady, a discussion on business recovery after the big one, and later separately a panel discussion with the safety, security, and emergency personnel experts about what happens in Huntington Beach when the big one hits. Give a tremendous uh, shout out and thank you and gratitude to the Orange County Association of Realtors. Dorissi Joan is really the reason that we are here tonight because um, without them, we wouldn't have been able to have Dr. Lucy. So if you could give a hand. <laughs> further ado, for those of you in the room who are groupies, Dr. Lucy Jones. <laughs> Sorry it got turned into such a hectic day today. I, I already had it pretty well uh, filled up before the magnitude 7.1 hit near Mexico City. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunately a very uh, sobering reminder of why we're doing this. There's already 120 confirmed dead and it's going to get worse. And some of, not all of it is the same issue here, but a lot of it is. We should not believe that that can't happen to us. It will happen to us to some extent. And I'm here tonight to, to help you understand why. I'm gonna start with a, just a couple of minutes to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. And one of them is to remind you what an earthquake really is, or at least what it is according to a seismologist. To us, the earthquake's the sudden slip of one block of rock past another that produces shaking as one of its effects. Just like when you snap your fingers, you have two surfaces that are in frictional contact, you push hard enough to overcome the friction, you release energy in the form of a sound wave that's traveling from my fingers to the microphone or to your ears and vibrating everything in between. So when the earthquake slips, and this is a picture from, uh, Co uh, from Kobe uh, in Japan in 1995 <coughs> on, the, on the, the right here, you can see how the fault moved from here to here. This used to be, this is a rice paddy. So that fault moved a distance of about six feet and released shaking during that event. Uh, this part was, a rice, was the rice paddy. Much of the fault was actually within the city. It was exactly one year after the Northridge earthquake and caused much worse shaking than Northridge did. It was about twice as large and the fault ran right through the middle of the old part of the city. With Northridge, this was not an urban hit. It was a suburban hit. And the strongest shaking, in fact, was up in the Santa Susana Mountains. So we haven't had an urban earthquake since the 6.3 Long Beach earthquake, which wasn't that big. And at some point, we're going to be having sevens in the urban area and looking more like what's going on in Mexico today than what we're th thinking about from the earthquakes we know. Um, and I, I wanted to point this out at helping understand the difference between magnitude and intensity. Magnitude is one number that we create to represent the total energy released in the earthquake. So in 1857, we had a magnitude 7.9 on the San Andreas. And in Northridge in 94, we had a 6.7. Notice how the difference in the length of the fault. So here's the fault for this earthquake for 1857, and here's the fault for Northridge in about the same scale, okay? It would take 25 Northridge earthquakes laid end to end <coughs> to get the fault that produced the earthquake in 1857, right? The other point I wanna make here is epicenter does not matter. After 80 years of Caltech telling you about it, you think it does, it doesn't. What it is is the place on the, on the fault where the rupture begins. So in 1857, the epicenter is up here, but it then ripped down the fault, just like tearing a piece of paper, and energy came off of every part of that fault. And so you could be sitting here, say, in Palmdale, right on top of that earthquake, even though you're 200 miles away from the epicenter. 
Northridge also. I mean, you think of it, you hear it as the Northridge, it was down here, it's only a 10 mile fault. But Chatsworth was actually closer to the earthquake than Northridge because the fault dipped in an angle and it was closer to the surface under Chatsworth than it was under Northridge. So just don't, don't think about epicenter, think about the fault. That's the description of the source of the earthquake. What you receive, that shaking, is described with intensity. Sort of one of the big communications things. I'll say the earthquake's the movement of the fault that produces shaking as one of its effects. To just about everybody else, the earthquake's the shaking, right? And so when we say this and we talk about the earthquake being the movement of the fault, people think they're feeling the movement of the fault. You're not. You're feeling the shaking that comes out from it. And it does die off with distance from the fault. So these colors on these two maps is showing you the intensity of the shaking. The intensity is defined by the amount of damage that it does. Intensity 9 is the level where we're damaging even quite modern buildings. Intensity 7 is where unreinforced masonry is almost all destroyed or very badly damaged. Intensity 6 is where you're throwing things off of shelves. Intensity 5 was defined as being everybody's frightened. So that's sort of, that's a rather subjective description, isn't it? Um, so we have tried to correlate it with our uh, measurements of ground motion, so ground acceleration or ground velocity. And we now have what we call an instrumental intensity scale, where we try and compare that. Um, and you could, the overall picture of damage is about the same, but it's a different picture. If you're right on top of a six, you might be intensity eight, and you're going to be hit with really jerky motion and high frequency and everything thrown off the shelves in your house and you know, cr your chimneys collapsed and cracked through your buildings. If you are intensity eight and a magnitude nine, you're 200 miles away. There's no high frequency motion yet. Your single family home is probably doing just fine, but we're collapsing high rises. You know, so it's a different picture because of the frequency distribution and, and uh, all the, just the differences between these types of earthquakes. There's just a lot of miscommunication out there. Magnitude, one number for the earthquake. Intensity is what you actually feel. I mean, I've been in magnitude nine. The ground motions from Japan moved the ground over here, just didn't feel it, right? So you can't say whether you've been, the magnitude isn't gonna tell you what happened to you. I keep on saying that the fault moves. Here's an example of the fault moving. This is from the Kaikoura earthquake in, in New Zealand last year. And this is actually, you see this road dropped down and moved over. So it dropped down about uh, eight feet and moved over about six feet. This is what happens on a fault. Anything crossing the fault gets broken. Right? You can see it here with the road quite clearly. Let's imagine there was a natural gas pipeline running underneath the road. It would also, it will be broken. You can't stop it, absolutely. And so this is one of the things that we as seismologists know is a really big issue and we've been trying to work with the community to say, let's look at what these fault crossing issues are. Because there's, a, there's damage that can't be prevented and is absolutely inevitable. And it's the only piece of the damage that we absolutely know where it's going to be. I remember having discussion with a pipeline operator, operator say, I've got a plan for my pipe breaking anywhere. I don't know where it's going to break. And I was like, it could break anywhere. It will break here. And so it's one of the things we need to take into effect. Count. So when we talk about the San Andreas earthquake for you, you guys are pretty far away from it. But there's a lot of things that have to cross the San Andreas Fault to get to you. Most noticeably, all of our outside water. Right? And almost all of our food comes in through, through distribution networks from, from like the staging is often in Victorville. All right. The San Andreas Fault is the biggest fault of California. Because it is the longest fault, it is capable of the biggest earthquakes. Remember I said the magnitude of the earthquake is the length of the fault that produces it. Right? So the seven that we just had in Mexico, that was probably about a 30 mile long fault. The eight that happened two weeks ago in Mexico is about a 150 mile long fault. The San Andreas needs more length to get the same size earthquake than some other faults. Um, the 200 mile long fault that we, made, we modeled to create the shakeout earthquake uh, produces a 7.8. Um, if we got the whole length of the fault from the Salton Sea up to central California, that's about an 8.2. So because it's the longest, it gives us the biggest earthquakes. It's also the fastest moving. 
So it gets the earthquakes most often. Uh, let me, um, yeah. W wanted to remind you about how we know about this. There's a field called paleoseismology, which is a type of geology where we literally dig a big trench across the fault that might be 20, 30 feet deep. This one's one of our deeper ones and go in and map exactly what happens across the fault here. This is sort of the definition of an introvert, somebody who wants to spend months inside a hole in the ground <laughs> is a great way uh, to spend your life. Um, Paleoseismologists are the most introverted of the, all the scientists I know. Right? We find the evidence of the earthquake and then we date the sediments that are broken by it and date the sediments that are not broken by it. And from that we can tell a, a date range for when the earthquakes uh, happen. And when we do that on the southernmost part of the San Andreas, we come up saying that we saw six earthquakes in the Coachella Valley between 800 and 1680, and none since then. This is the reason that the southern San Andreas is considered the most likely source of a big earthquake in the United States, because it averages 150 years between earthquakes, and it's been 340 since the last one. I used to say 330, it's now longer. So if we look here over the whole San Andreas, we can see the northern part moved this whole part from Cape Mendocino to, to down to a place near Gilroy, uh, moved in 1906. Between Gilroy and about Paso Robles, there's a section of the fault that doesn't seem to uh, accumulate strain for big earthquakes. It has little earthquakes and it moves at the surface. We can see it moving an inch and a half a year, which is about, it's about the same rate as your fingernails grow, but it's the amount that the San Andreas accumulates from geologic motion. So there in the central part, we aren't accumulating anything. Down here in uh, uh, the Coachella Valley, imagine what happens when you haven't cut your fingernails in 300 years. It's a pretty big offset that's accumulated about 30 feet. Okay. Um, we tried to model what that earthquake is. And uh, that's what's called the shakeout scenario. It was what led to the shakeout drill. That was supposed to be a one-time event <laughs> to explain to people what we found as we did all of this modeling. And as you heard, uh, as part of the process, we went out around the region and, and got all the emergency managers and, and talked them into doing a drill with us so that we could get everybody to talk about and think about what was happening. Um, I'll add to the, the, the story that you just heard at that meeting. Uh, I had actually said, you know, one of the problems is, is it's just been so long since there's been an earthquake. We can't, can't get people to focus on it. Two minutes later, 5.4, about 10 miles away. <laughs> and, uh, they all looked, that was why they took that man and looked at me and all was like, how did you get that to happen? Uh, <laughs> and then they joined me under the table. Okay, um, but, oh, how did I do that? So that, the point of this uh, is to, uh, say that we do have this report, the, I, I say we, it's produced by the U.S. Geological Survey because 10 years ago I was working for the U.S. Geological Survey. I did complete my federal service last year and now have my own center. The USGS continues to distribute all of this information. What's, this is called the Shakeout Earthquake Scenario, a story that Southern Californians are writing. This public version of it, we actually start 10 minutes before the earthquake and go to six months after and you can get it from the USGS websites. If you just look at the publications from the USGS and put in the shakeout scenario, you'll, you'll find the um, document. We also have made some movies of it. So one of the things we did, this is actually showing what the pattern of shaking is going to be like. On the left, this is modeling that was done by the seismologists, the USGS, and, and the various universities that work together. On the left, we're showing a map. This red line is the San Andreas Fault. The fault continues beyond here, but we just stopped the earthquake here. This is why it's a 7.8. The real earthquake may decide to go farther, but this way we could say we weren't going for the worst case scenario. We're, we're getting the ordinary one. It's a bit of a tricky thing because all of the shaking coming in, into LA and Orange counties comes in from the southernmost part of the fault. So we can say it's not that big, but in fact the damage here is as big as it's going to get and we just would be adding Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo to the, to the mix. And to be honest, they don't have that many people and it didn't really change the numbers. So we went with the smaller earthquake. Um, but uh, I've been talking away. It is now 55 seconds into the earthquake and the very first waves have come into Huntington Beach. Over here, we are looking over Huntington Beach, okay? 
Uh, there's Anaheim, Fountain Valley, Santa Ana. And it is only 70 some seconds into the earthquake before the S wave gets here with the strong shaking. This is what it means to be in loose soils and get amplified shaking. For those of you who are hearing what's happening in Mexico City, that's why they are having so much damage. They have extremely loose soils that amplify the shaking. It goes on here. So you can see that we have, it dies off with distance from the fault, but then we're getting this cluster of stronger shaking in here. And that's the amplification because we're sitting in a big bowl of the geologic equivalent of jello. And you know, when you shake a bowl of jello, even when you stop shaking, it continues to wobble around for a while. And that's what goes on within these soils. We made a movie about what this would be like uh, to help people understand. Thursday, November 13, 2008. It's a sunny morning in Southern California. Across the region, 7.5 million people are busy at work. Several hundred thousand of them are commuting to jobs in different counties, far from where they live. Over 200,000 commuters work and reside on opposite sides of the San Andreas Fault. Today, these families and many others across the region be separated. Eighteen hundred people will die. Fifty-three thousand people will be injured. And two hundred thirteen billion dollars in damage will occur. It's 10 a.m. The largest earthquake to hit Southern California in modern times has just begun. Some people react appropriately. Others don't. In the intense shaking, nearly 1,500 buildings collapse. Infrastructure is severely compromised, and 300,000 buildings suffer significant damage. The rupture travels 200 miles northwest along the San Andreas Fault. Violent shaking lasting as long as two minutes in some areas. Finally, the earthquake is over. Many of the lifelines of Southern California have been disrupted. A large number of people are trapped in collapsed buildings. Over 1,600 fires start, some turning into super conflagrations. Millions of people are trying to use their phones, causing the system to become overloaded. In the months ahead, there will be tens of thousands of aftershocks. Residents will struggle to recover from the earthquake. There will be no water for weeks or months, and no electricity. Traveling from point to point within the city will be extremely difficult, and 255,000 people will be displaced from their homes. We are all in this together. We will suffer the consequences if we don't do our part right now. How quickly life gets back to normal after this disaster is up to you and those around you. Your level of personal preparedness will determine your quality of life after the quake, it's a good idea to have a fire extinguisher, a first aid kit, and enough water for each person in your household to have at least one gallon of water a day for three days. Have an emergency plan. Decide now where you will meet your family after an earthquake. Make sure there's a person out of town you can contact to let your loved ones know that you're okay. Homeowners should be sure to bolt their house to its foundation. Consider whether earthquake insurance makes sense for you as part of your financial plan. Even if you're not a homeowner, you can secure your personal possessions against earthquake damage. Preparedness is not only for the home, but also for business. Be sure that your company has emergency plans for a major earthquake. Empower yourself and your family. Be prepared. For more information, visit www.usps.gov slash shakeout.
uh, we, had, we had to struggle to get uh, the USGS to agree to that form of publication. We actually, uh, there's also a scientific report for those of you who want to go through the 300 pages of the report and the 800 pages of appendices documenting how we came up with all of those numbers. Um, so that's what it would be if it happened, well, in 2008. What can we do differently? And to answer that question, I want to look at what it is that's really at risk. And one of the things that makes these earthquakes so scary is the fact that there's so many of us together. And we are dependent on a lot of systems to keep our life working. And when some of us have problems, when we're built, you know, put in this densely, and I'm showing Huntington Beach here, but you know, the rest of the city keeps on going for a long ways beyond here, the, the, the greater urban area. Um, how do we keep that working? And so we talked about urban disaster resilience, how to have a society that's still functioning after the earthquake, and thought about what would be necessary to try and make this be the case. Um, so one of the things, when you think about a city, I think of it as, maybe, as a system of systems. When you build a city, the first thing you do is put in pipes underground. It does mean our pipes are some of our oldest features. And on top of those pipes, we go and build the city that we live in. We put in the houses that we live in, the buildings that we work in, our manufacturing centers, our power systems, transportation systems, communication systems. And all of these systems are there to support our life. And as our urban areas get denser and our technology improves, our systems become more complicated. And we are dependent on those systems for our lives. You know, in 1906, when you lost your sewer, you put an outhouse in your backyard. We can't really do that for 17 million people anymore. There are a set of necessary systems to keep the function working. So we've got all these sort of processes of modern life. We have our banking and our schools and our businesses and our supply chains. They're based around a set of critical systems. I think your, your uh, utilities in modern world communication and our buildings. And what we're trying to do is keep those working to the point that we can continue to have our life. So we look at these core functions and what's required to, to keep them going. Part of them lie with our governments, part of them lie with our businesses. We aren't trying to make them be perfect. What we are trying to do is get them working well enough that we can continue to function. As an example, so we lose some buildings. Well, if we've got internet, then people can still telecommute and they don't lose their job because their office building is gone. Or if we lose water, which we're almost certain to do, but we still have decent transportation, FEMA's got major plans for bringing water in for us. So it'll help us get through the crises. We do have to figure out how to get these systems back up more quickly. Because it's one thing for them to bring in drinking water. But how many of you will stay here when you haven't had a shower in a month? And your neighbor hasn't had a shower in a month? You know, and, and, and it's a serious public health issue if we really get to that position. So we have to figure out not just how to cope in the immediate aftermath, but how to get it back up more quickly. Let's look at what some of the core issues are. As I said, our foreign water, as DWP likes to call it. Coming in, we have four major aqueducts. They all cross, this is the San Andreas. They all cross the San Andreas to get here. And an analysis of this, yeah has suggested they're all going to break in the same earthquake because that's what it means to be a big earthquake, is to break the full length of the fault. And it's going to take up to 18 months to repair them. Um, we also are going to be damaging pipes in the ground. As I said, they're the oldest part of our systems, of our cities, right? And when we got everybody together, we ended up concluding, after the working through the, with the water companies, it's going to take six months to get water back into everybody's house. So when you want to think about how do you make your city better prepared, you want water at your house. You want to store extra water. But you might also want, as a city, to look at what you can do to improve your water pipes. And the work I did with the mayor of Los Angeles in 2014, he's made a commitment to a, a future of seismic-resistant pipes. Their goal is to get that in across the city of Los Angeles. 
Of course, since they're already on a 350 year replacement cycle for all their pipes, <laughs> they gotta figure out the money issue, but at least that's their objective, all right? The other thing is fire following earthquake. When the earthquake happens, it sets off fires. When Northridge happened, there were 110 fires that were generated. And we have mutual aid. Firemen poured in from San Bernardino, from Ventura, to help Los Angeles fight the fire. When we have this earthquake, with a 25 times longer fault, we are going to be seeing fires across the region. And when we estimate 1,600 fires would be generated, um, and you know, your, your request for mutual aid is going to be met with a plea for help in return. We're going to have to be getting mutual aid from San Francisco and Arizona, and it's going to take a long time to get here. So there's a real potential that the fire is going to get out of control. And how to fight those fires is going to be a really big deal. Um, one of the things to do about this personally, have a fire extinguisher and know how to use it. Because in a, in a situation where you would normally call the fire department and they'd say, don't fight it yourself, they aren't going to be able to respond to you. They probably aren't going to be able to get your call. And so the ability to fight anything you can yourself, uh, remember it's a different situation. We're also looking at a lot of communication disruption. Um, we, well, that was impressive. <laughs> um, the, uh, I, I, that was intentional. OK, I was thinking, whoa, the lights go out just when I say the electricity could be gone. Um, I, uh, Estimates of how long range from three days to three years. And I think we don't know really well. Do you get Edison service here? Um, the good news is Edison has recently really gotten engaged on this issue. About three years ago, they got a new CEO who happens to be married to a seismologist. And as he told me, plausible deniability just went out the window. <laughs> um, and they are working very hard, and I'm very impressed with what they're doing. Not that it's solved, but at least they are trying hard to look the, the real problem in the face. Um, cell towers. Nobody wants generators at the cell towers, not in our backyard. So our cell towers are almost all battery powered, which means they're about four hours. There's a move to try and get it up to eight. So uh, uh, in the long run, you won't be having cell service when, once the electricity goes out. And um, so there's two things. One, you know, cells just don't, your cell phone doesn't work like during rush hour, right? You know? And so when the, you get the demand, actually that time in Chino Hills 10 years ago, uh, I, no way I could get a phone call out at all. And that was just a 5.7. Uh, but I did, uh, it was very easy to text because it doesn't take much bandwidth at all, right? And so uh, text don't talk in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake and get it done within four hours because it won't be working after that. The other thing is, you know, internet is designed to handle the nuclear holocaust. It will be functioning after the earthquake. The question will be whether you can connect to it. And you might very well not be able to, because there's a lot of power needs between your computer and actually getting your data going down that internet stream. And there's routers and, and Wi-Fi and a lot of things in between. If you have missing backup power on any of those, you lose connectivity. So as a business uh, resilience issue, Really think about what is your power sources for your internet connectivity. Transportation is a known problem in lots of earthquakes. Um, it's also one that we've had a lot of, so we do a really good job of dealing with it. We always do a great job of preparing for the last earthquake. Uh, Caltrans has spent over $10 billion since the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989 brought down the Bay Bridge. Um, our freeway bridges are in much, much better shape. I think it's likely that they'll do really pretty well. The problem is that money, none of that money went to cities or counties. So any bridges that are locally maintained have not had the advantage of that resource. And, uh, so we, and then there's going to be other transportation problems as well, such as like when you don't have power and you don't have stoplights. And when you have damaged buildings and therefore debris in the road, there's a lot of ways in which uh, transportation gets disrupted. Um, come on. Oh, right. I think I actually made a list of this and forgot. Um, at least that's one thing about living here by the ocean. Landslides are not such a big issue. Um, Cajon Pass, it's a whole lot bigger a deal. OK. Um, I said this at the beginning, just how much of our um, uh, life support comes in across the San Andreas. And especially at places like Cajon Pass, which is what this picture is, we have co-located lifelines where you have gasoline lines 
am crossing natural gas lines right next to a freeway and a railway. And, and all of them crossed by the San Andreas Fault within 400 meters of each other. So this is an issue where actually, as I said, I've been working with Edison, we're working with the gas company, looking at places where the, co the, the codependence is making a difference. It's one of the things I'm doing with my, with my new center, is trying to help provide a space where this stuff can really be looked at. Um, but at this point, it's still a really major issue, and that's one of your big things is supply chain. On a personal level, I never used to store food. I said, look at the electricity's out. All of the restaurants are going to be giving away their food. I'm going to have food you know, defrosting in my freezer, um, and no big deal. Once we started really looking at this, and another thing that has changed, when Northridge happened, we had warehouses in the Inland Empire from which the grocery chain stocked their stores. The computer, internet, <coughs> by the way, the, you know, the internet, the very first internet browser came out three months after Northridge. We haven't had a big earthquake with the internet. And we now have just-in-time economy. We have uh, supply chains that restock every day on the fly from the computer generation. And all of those warehouses are gone. Nobody's storing food in the LA Basin anymore. It means all of our food is cheaper on a regular basis, but it also means we don't have the backup supply that we used to have. I've started storing more food, and I actually have undertaken a thing where I um, get a, a set of food, it costs about $50 worth of things that I know that, that we'll eat. Um, and then once a year, I donate it to a food bank and buy myself a new set. Save that receipt, I've now got a tax donation, the food bank's got food, and I have a food supply for when this is gone. Um, there's also a potential for a lot of fire. I've talked a lot about the fire. The fires in the forest will not be fought. Our firemen are going to be completely busy fighting fires that are endangering people. So we have the potential for a really serious ecological problem as, as fires get going in those regions. Um, so summarizing the big issues in the big one, we can be losing lives in old buildings. Because uh, your building code is, I actually I realized I didn't do this in this presentation, did I? Your buildings are as good as the building code in place when they were built. Who has a house that was built before 1997? You are not built to the current code, right? And there is undoubtedly, though, then there's something that you can do to make your house safer. And I've, we've moved a few times, every time we've bought a house, the first thing we do is bring in a foundation specialist to look at our foundation, look at whether we're bolted, look at our cripple wall, and ask them what can we do to make our house stronger. And once we spent nothing, that was when we bought a slab, a slab on grade, uh, we have spent, the other times it's somewhere between $200 and $1,500. Now, I don't buy an old house that isn't even bolted to its foundation. Then you might get up into a few thousand dollars. But this is the difference between potentially no damage at all and completely losing your house. So if you own a house, go get a foundation specialist, look at what can be done. The California Earthquake Authority is starting to pay in some communities to support brace and bolt. Um, they go through by zip code. They add a new, new set of zip codes each year but the city could go to apply to them to be, to be part of the program. And then they give up to $3,000 to do it. So it's, um, um, when you look though, the big issues here, this is not something that's gonna kill most of you. 1,800 people dying in this earthquake that doesn't happen very often. You are far more likely to be murdered in Southern California than die in an earthquake. <laughs> Isn't that a great news? I, uh, <laughs> and don't even get me started about traffic accidents, right? Way more dangerous than any of either of those. We are afraid of earthquakes because of the suddenness and we don't know and the fear and we think about dying. You should not be thinking, worried about dying in this earthquake. You need to be worried about living after the earthquake and just how miserable life is going to be. And it's really disruptive to businesses and if we get too much business disruption, Let's imagine we've lost a lot of housing. And then a lot of people who you know, can't, afford, can't stay here, they don't have their house anymore. And Google said, you know, they're working for Google and they say, hey, go work out of your, your parents' garage or wherever you want to work. And they leave. And then the restaurants that they frequented and the dry cleaners and all those other businesses no longer have their clients. And then there's other people who lose their job completely. All of those things can be really disruptive to an economy. And that's what we're worried about, is how do we keep things going well enough 
that people don't give up and leave. And the other thing to remember is that when we have this situation, it's going to be a region-wide disruption. You guys are going to be the lucky ones. Relative to the other communities, you aren't going to be having too hard a time. But of course, there's other faults that we could get you with. Here's a map of faults across Southern California. Um, and you don't have as many down here as we do up in the northern side of the basin. But you've got the Newport Inglewood Fault. You've got the San Joaquin Hills Fault. You've got the Elsinore Fault. You've got a bunch of choices. Uh, and if, you know, for an example, here would be that same type of shake map showing you the distribution of shaking. This is a model of a Newport Inglewood earthquake, a seven on the Newport Inglewood. And you guys are then the, the epicenter. You guys are going to be the ones that have the most level of damage. Um, this is to make the point, just as, as I was saying, that this is really about keeping the economy going. This is the gross domestic product of Nashville and New Orleans. Before Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, they were similar sized cities. Actually, New Orleans was a little bit bigger. They had $80 million in direct losses at the time of the, of the hurricane. And then in the next seven years, they cumulatively lost $105 billion in GDP. The not recovering quickly can dwarf the losses in the event itself. So what I'm trying to advocate for is let's minimize our damage that lets our economy get going. And when we think about preparing, it's not just about let it all get damaged and how do we pick up the pieces, how do we have the water, how do we have the family plan or whatever. How about preventing those losses? If your house isn't damaged because you retrofitted it, you don't need to worry about whether or not FEMA is going to pay up this time. Uh, and we really need to change our outlook on it if we want to get through this without serious damage to the economy. And we need to remember that it's not, those lost numbers are people who left. And that's part of what we're doing to here. Earthquakes are an extremely traumatic experience. And we need a community that's helping us to want to stay after the earthquake. And the more that we can do together, yes, it's great what you can do on your own, but if you can get your church or your synagogue or your PTA or some other community organization to do it together, more people have made those changes and you've got an organization that's stronger and will help people stay here after the event. Let me, just what can you do? I've given you a couple examples. So when we talk about what you're likely to face, it's a combination of what the earth does to you and what you do to prevent the losses. And if you put it together, you'd say, you've got what the, what's the hazard? What are the faults? What's the landsliding or liquefaction? To what degree have you put our buildings on top of it? Um, how, what are the fragilities of those buildings? Uh, how well do we respond? Divide by the response, because we respond well, we can reduce what those losses are. And then I put in this last thing, which is, I must be losing my battery or something on this. Yeah. The will to recover. How much is your community there and wanting to work together to do this? So what can we do about them? You can use science to understand the hazard, but we aren't going to change the hazard. Plate tectonics isn't stopping even if we want it to, right? So what we can do is use science to understand it and accept that the faults are going to move and any human structures across it will move with it, and we figure out how to work with that. For exposure, we could say, let's stay off the faults, because when you're right near the earthquake, it's definitely not worse. Problem is, we don't know which fault's going next. And it's really too late. We have, uh, every one of us lives within about five miles of an active fault. You can't get much farther than five miles anywhere in Southern California. Um, response, that's the place that we think about. That's where we have our firemen, where we think about our water, where we think about cert teams. And I'd say we've probably got the best in the world. Part of that's because emotionally, that's what we think getting ready for an earthquake is all about, how to get that response done. And I'd leave it to the other experts in the room to really give you more details about this. I put in a few things that I think are important. I've already gone through this. And I, having water, being ready for the fires, planning with your family, and planning with your community. What are you doing together? You know, a lot of people, believe that we're going to be having a lot of looting, that things are going to be getting really bad, and how, you know, how can you trust people? Plenty of people put guns in their earthquake kits. That is a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
If you believe your enemy is going to be your neighbor, you can sure make that true. And I'd like to see us working more about working with our neighbors so we still want to be here afterwards. Then the other really big issue is the fragility of our built environment. And this is a variety of issues. One, as I've said repeatedly, you know, buildings are only as good as the building code in place. Retrofitting is getting your built building made stronger. I've done it voluntarily every time I've owned a building. Uh, and volunteering is great. Uh, several communities are moving to mandatory because when your neighbor's building is damaged, you may not be allowed to go home to your own place because a badly damaged building is going to be red tagged during the aftershock sequence, but the adjoining buildings, if they're close enough, will also be red tagged because it's just too dangerous that the damaged building could collapse on them. So in our denser urban environments, one person's financial choice to not retrofit their building means everybody else loses, everybody around them loses the use of their own building. There is also the issue that our current building code is intended to keep the buildings from killing you. We philosophically say, if you want to have such a weak building that it's a total financial loss, that's your financial choice to make. The role of government is to make sure you don't kill somebody in the process. The problem being, as I just said, you're now taking everyone else's use of the buildings next to you away. Um, but also, you know, a badly damaged building that doesn't get rebuilt isn't really good for the property values around it. And we know we really aren't in isolation and everyone's financial decisions are affecting all of us. I am actually working now to try and get the building code shifted to be what's called an immediate occupancy standard. Right now, a brand new building, if it doesn't kill you, it was a success. I would like to have it be that you can use your building after the earthquake, that you can walk inside safely. And the estimates are that it would add about 1% to 2% the cost of construction. It's not a lot of money. And I think it may be the difference between financial ruin after the earthquake and a community that can get back together. And if you think that's too extreme, let me ask you to look at Christchurch, New Zealand. This is what it looked like in 2010, 450,000 people. The earthquake in 2011 ran right through the middle of the town. It was only a 6.3, but literally ran through the city. And the building code did what it was supposed to. No new building collapsed. They had two partial collapses, one of them that killed most of the, the victims. Uh, that was a 1963 non-ductile reinforced concrete building, that type of building that LA's just mandated everybody retrofit. Um, the building officials could look at this and say it was a success. Five years after the earthquake, they had torn down 1,800 buildings. Those buildings didn't kill people, but they couldn't be used. They lost their downtown. And they are recovering because they have 95% insurance coverage on their buildings. We have about 10%. We won't be having the money coming in. So, you know, when we face this situation, and we will, we have exactly the same building code, very similar systems, at the, and uh, um, we're going to really be struggling to bring our business communities back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.